Hello, Nancy, Mark Chang. All the best. Hi. Thank you. Hi, Porsche. Tony, Jayo. <laughs> I think we're going to wait just a minute. So give people just a little more time to, to come on. Hello, Chen Yen. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Is that Chen Yen? Yes. And because he. That's people. Hello, Ricky. Hello, Ricky. So while we are waiting. Yes. So hello, everyone. I think we'll get started. Um, my name is, is Nancy Wallace. I am the UN representative for the World Federation for Mental Health. And I'd like to introduce my partners in this program, uh, Jue Chang, uh, professor from Taiwan. She has um, been a longtime board member and uh, a participant uh, of WFMH for many years. And um, I would like to introduce Connie Gann. And Connie is from Australia, uh, originally from Malaysia. And she is going to, um, and, and Connie is, has also been a, a member of WFMH for a, many, a long time. And all three of us have been participating in NGO CSW for many, many years. Um, so we're just pleased. We've been doing panels. WFMH has been doing panels on mental health at WCHSW, NGO CSW um, since 1999. So we've been around uh, in the system for quite some time. Um, I wanted to direct you to the file of, of, uh, on the website. Um, I've downloaded our bios, which will give you a little bit more information about us. Uh, and contact information for all three of us, if any of you want to get in touch with us after the presentation, um, and also a copy of the flyer of the program. So today we're going to talk about... Um, we're gonna be addressing mental health consequences of sexual and gender-based violence. Um, this is a particularly important um, important topic, uh, not only for, um, for all of us that are here at CSW, but, um, but particularly for WFMH and for myself, um, because of the implications that gender-based violence has on mental health consequences. Um, unfortunately, mental health is often, is, is very often not one of the primary discussions when we talk about gender-based violence, particularly when it comes to policies um, or when we speak about interventions. Um, and so it's critical for us to really be talking about how mental health integrates with gender-based violence and why it's so important for us to really um, raise awareness about, about mental health. Um, So one of the things that I do want to say, sorry for the the um, for the little little glitches here, 
but I wanted to um, speak, I wanted to talk about how it is, we've really come to a critical mass um, in dealing with uh, gender-based violence um, because it is, it is, while there's a perception that because we are becoming much more aware of the problem, because we are addressing many issues related to gender, that the violence against women and girls um, and LGBTQ people um, and, and also uh, people of color, that in fact, violence is, is somewhat decreasing because of this awareness and the advocacy and the changes that are going on in society, particularly like um, movements the, like the Me Too movement, um, which is bringing great aware of to the problem. But unfortunately, the truth is, is that we are in a global epidemic if you want to say a pandemic of, of gender-based violence. We are seeing increases in violence of, literally across the world in every country, every city around the world. Um, there's sometimes a perception that in certain parts of the world that there's less violence and there is in other places because of cultural practices or government uh, regulations or uh, the laws. Um, or religious practices, but in fact, that's actually not true. Um, what we see are differences in different kinds of, of um, gender-based violence that is prevalent or, or somewhat prevalent or exists in certain parts of the, kind of the world that may not exist great the same prevalence in other parts, but it's certainly the numbers are made up uh, by the fact that um, there is significant gender-based violence in the home. Um, and so what we're seeing is, I just wanted to give you a little perspective on this. Globally, we're seeing that 35% of women have actually experienced physical and or sexual intimate partner violence or sexual violence by a non-partner. So if you think about everybody that's on the program today, and you really think about that a third of us have been in some way experienced gender-based violence in our lifetimes, um, and in fact, they really do believe that it's so underreported that the numbers may be as high as 70% of women have actually experienced some gender-based violence in their lifetime. Unfortunately, that violence is often, particularly sexual abuse, um, is oftentimes perpetrated against very young girls. Uh, I am a psychotherapist um, in my other life, and I have to say that the prevalence of sexual abuse in the adult women that I see is exceptionally high. Um, and uh, it, it's always astonishing to me that when you begin to scratch the surface of mental health problems for people, what you often find underlying it is a long, long history of, of sexual uh, or physical abuse in people in women's lifetimes. Um, and the figures that I'm quoting right now actually do not even include sexual harassment, which we all believe, of course, is a form of gender-based violence. And also, if you want to think about how, how, how uh, that what's so amazing is that there's 137 women are killed by a member of their family every single day throughout the world. That's an amazing amount of, of a number of, of people being killed. Um, the other part of this, which is difficult, is that less than 40% of women who experience violence actually seek help of any type, which means that, and that means going to the police, seeking medical care. Um, many of these women don't even tell, tell no one speak, never speak of the violence that they've experienced in their lifetime. So when you think about mental health implications or the impact on people's mental, women's mental health as a result of the violence that they've experienced, it means in fact that, that those women are, are uh, not getting, being able to get any kind of help at all if they're not reporting their experiences. Um, and what we know are that the rates of depression, having an abortion, acquiring HIV AIDS and high in, is, um, are higher in women who have experienced um, gender-based violence. So is mental health at risk when, we're, when we speak of um, gender-based violence? Well, the answer is, is that the mental health implications are catastrophic. Um, the impact um, long-term or even lifetime 
for women who've experienced violence in their life is significant. And the kinds of things that we are seeing in the mental health impact are um, major depressive disorders or depression, um, anxiety, panic disorders, and sometimes post-traumatic stress disorder um, if the impact, the mental health impact is, is um, severe enough. Um, we also see a wide range of substance abuse disorders uh, and increase in women who have uh, experienced violence. So the other part, whatever, what also happens oftentimes with survivors uh, of violence is that they internalize not only the verbal, the physical abuse, but sometimes the verbal abuse from partners. And sometimes the verbal abuse you know, it can be significantly more impactful or severe, have a severe impact on women uh, than physical violence sometimes. You know? And with physical violence, you can certainly see the scars on someone's body. You see the impact on someone's body. But the verbal abuse that women often experience is so internal, internalized that it is often very hard to see. Um, women will often blame themselves for their situations. Uh, they feel that it is their fault. They experience shame and fear and anger and resentment towards themselves and oftentimes others. Um, the difficulty with this is that it often interferes with a woman's ability to really form form relationships with other with other people. It impacts the it, the relationships that they can have with partners uh, or developing intimate relationships. It can um, interfere with their uh, sexual lives. It can interfere with, even with their relationships and the, can get passed on to their children. One of the things that we see is oftentimes generational abuse. So when you look at somebody or if you are really um, working with someone who has experienced violence, when you begin to explore their family history, you often can go back to parents or mothers and grandmothers who have also lived within with um, gender-based violence throughout their lifetime. So this kind of experience sometimes is really a, um, a generational one. And chronic abuse can sometimes also lead to um, compulsion of compulsive and obsessive behaviors and can be very and lead to self-destructive behaviors or an increase in suicidal suicidal ideation or suicide uh, among women. So the mental health consequences, um, I wanted to just identify a few others, which is that trauma often leads survivors to experience difficulty in new relationships, which I already indicated. And uh, the uh, GBV survivors are also more likely to have higher rates of medical problems. Um, and they often perceive them their own. It's often a somatic, so, so what we call a somatic response. It means that they can perceive that their overall health is generally poor. But we see lifestyle related illnesses, non communicable disease, um, uh, um, medical problems at higher rates among women who have experienced violence. So when we talk about lifestyle or the NCDs, we're really talking about things like asthma and obesity, um, some heart disease, hypertension, uh, and, um, and, and others, um, and even um, ultimately cancers as a result of the stress, um, depression, anxiety, the mental health implications that are the lasting legacy of violence. Um, and it can also result in unplanned pregnancies and pregnant pregnancy complications for mothers, the mother and child. Um, when we talk about those kinds of um, uh, physical symptoms that women sometimes experience, and these sometimes goes on through their lifetime, um, they can be impacted by injuries. Um, I have someone that I'm working with now who was um, both sexually abused in her childhood and physically abused throughout her childhood and um, physically abused by her husband for 10 years before she was able to leave him. Uh, she's now in her late 50s and she is having neurological problems from, um, from, brain, um, from brain damage that she occurred in, that, she, that 
that happened when she was beaten by her husband. Um, so, and, and it's really quite terrifying. And unfortunately it's brought up for her and she's going lot through lots of exams and, and seeing doctors now for these, the neurological problems she's having. And it's really frightening because it's bringing up all the traumatic memories of what occurred to her in, uh, during her childhood and in her early marriage. Um, so we also see chronic pain um, and sometimes choking sensations, hyperventilation, uh, gastrointestinal, uh, uh, gastrointestinal problems, and chest, back, and pelvic pain. Um, so these are these are the, the things that are not often talked about. But living with these kinds of physical symptoms can also have it, exacerbate and make the mental health um, problems much worse for women. Um, and we also know that um, survivors of violence are also disproportionately affected by HIV AIDS. So I just, I briefly want to talk about actions to, to address um, violence and mental health. I mean, these are the recommended um, um, advocacy actions that I think that we all need to engage in to make sure that we are increasing the amount of research that is being done in the area of GBV and mental health. Um, there is some amount of research, but it is certainly not enough to really allow us to know the extent that um, violence has um, in impacting women's well-being um, within the short term and in the long term throughout her lifetime. We need to really do a much better job of doing training and education. Um, and training is not only an education, not only of professionals, but I think we really need to expand it. You know, we often think about, you know, that mental health people are the ones that have all the knowledge and how to work with people who have experienced violence. Um, and unfortunately, I have to say, being in the field, that I don't often think that we receive enough training in the area of, of, of gender-based violence uh, and um, and, and, and the mental health implications. Trauma is often very difficult to, to work with. And it's very difficult to confront when you're working with somebody to really allow somebody the opportunity to really speak about some really, sometimes really horrible experiences that they have had in their lifetime. Um, sometimes you as a, as a counselor, a therapist, a social worker, a psychologist may be the very first time that somebody has ever shared their experiences with, with that person or out, have ever experienced, shared outside in their lifetime. And so without training and education in this area, it sometimes is very difficult for counselors um, or therapists to really work with people and to really be able to help them uh, get through. But I also think we need to do a better, I, um, better job at ed educating people outside of the mental health field. We need to incorporate training and education for groups of uh, like teachers. We need to work, do training and education with reproductive health um, um, programs and organizations. We need to educate the police and the judicial system. So we need to really um, to really expand the amount of training and education we do. I think we also need to do education in, in schools and to be, really begin to think about the kind of education that we can target to young children um, to begin to um, help them um, learn how to um, to, to uh, especially girls to help protect themselves, to understand um, how they can be more confident and have better self-esteem so that they can better confront um, violence if, if they are ever exposed to it. Um, we also need to enhance the competency of primary health care providers. Women often the first line of, of, um, of the first place that women will often go to is their primary care provider. And many primary care providers are not trained or educated in the area of working with violence and trauma. And so it's a really important group that we need to incorporate and to bring into um, the awareness about and, and know how to treat women appropriately. We also need to increase professional capacity. We don't have enough people who know how to work with mental health. 
issues that arise. And this is not only for issues with violence, but this is true across the mental health spectrum. Um, and so we really need to, pro to increase professional uh, capacity, which would include also training um, medical providers, um, teachers and others in basic interventions that would they would be able to work to help um, on some basic level and to be identified, be able to identify people or women that need more serious intervention, which they then could refer to mental health professionals. Um, so we really need to imp improve the professional capacity. Um, we also need to think about the kind of an interventions that are both culturally and gender appropriate. Um, we have some interventions which have proved to be very effective, but we need to perhaps um, really think about, to, we need to do more research to know whether the interventions that we are using are actually beneficial, helpful to women, particularly over a long-term basis. Um, we need to do assessment and evaluation. Um, one of the things that I think is difficult with promoting mental health um, and making the interconnections with gender-based violence is that we're not doing enough assessment of, of, uh, of the problem and, the, um, and, and we're not doing enough evaluation of the interventions and the um, policies and programs that we have available. So we need to incorporate that. We also need to advocate for national mental health policies. There are not many countries in the world that have um, national mental health policies. Uh, and th that's really um, a very serious problem because we could um, develop better programs um, to fund programs better to really help countries at, um, 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 invest in mental health if we had that kind of national mental health policies. And finding regarding the funding and resources, one of the things I want you all to know is that in most countries, less than 2% of the, of the national health budget is allocated to mental health. Now, you think about that, that's kind of an extraordinary number. I'm not talking about 2% of the gross national product. I'm talking about 2% of the national health budget. And so this is an area of advocacy that in every country, we really need to really advocate to our governments that they must increase the amount of money that is allocated to mental health um, programs. And if we were able to somehow just target and increase uh, that percentage by 1%, we would really have a much better significant mental health systems in every country that would be able to manage and, and handle these problems. Um, the, um, I wanted to talk also a little about uh, gender specific risk factors. Um, so we know that mental health factors are significantly intertwined with other risk factors. And in particular, they are for women, they are related to their um, their gender-based roles, traditional roles, um, being caregivers, being caretakers, um, and the stressors that ne negative life experiences and events have on women. Um, and now that we're beginning to see an increase of those kinds of negative life experiences, we can relate this to climate change, to natural disasters, the increase in natural disasters, um, and, and other factors that are going on. Um, we also know that GBV is significantly tied to socioeconomic um, factors as well. So women that are um, lower income um, due to income inequality, <clears throat> to um, lack of human rights, um, to the, their low or subordinate social status and rank, um, and they're really, and, and the caregiver role while it is, it is an important role, it also creates enormous stress for many women. Um, and so we, um, and, and, and so it's important for us to really begin to understand how often women who are poor, um, who live in environments that are, um, that are, um, that don't have, have less access to medical care, have less access to equality, have less access to resources in which that could help and support them. Um, wow. Also, 
Um, women, as I said before, are reluctant to disclose their history of violence, um, of being, and, 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 but most of the time they will often report to their physicians first. And often many physicians along with families will, will not acknowledge the violence that a woman has experienced. One of the other factors that has arisen in the last year, of course, is that women and girls are experiencing increased gender-based violence during COVID. And we are seeing this significantly here in the United States. Um, and unfortunately, our mental health system, which I think is probably one of the better systems in the world, we most of the mental health programs in the country are, are literally overrun. There are huge waiting lists for people to get in for services during this dearth that, that has occurred during COVID. Um, and the last I want to say is that governments need to do more to monitor and intervene to prevent violence in, against, uh, against women. I do believe that we really live in a culture, while we are all aware that gender-based violence really occur is, is, is there, and we, we, many of us have experienced ourselves. But unfortunately, we live in a culture, in a, in a global culture, that there is on some level a tolerance for violence. If there was less intolerance, if there was more intolerance, we would see a significant reduction in, in violence. And, 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 and it comes because of the silence of the victims. It comes because of the silence of, of, per, of, the, of the system. Um, or the, 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 um, the inability or the reluctance uh, in the systems to really address gender-based violence and for us to really develop a, an attitude that violence will not at all. Uh, and I think that we really have to really develop that, that attitude and really work towards advocacy to say we will not tolerate violence. I think movements like the Me Too movements and others that are growing around the world are wonderful in bringing awareness to the issue. But we need, all of us need to join and to really demand that this will no longer be tolerated, that women will be safe in their homes, that women will be safe on the streets. Uh, awesome. And, and that's the truth. Women do not live in fear. That most women have walked through the world and with some low level of stress and fear of being violated in their lifetime. And that is not acceptable. And so we therefore really have to work on advocating more strongly. Um, and also I really believe we have to work on partnering with men to make sure that we are really moving this agenda of gender-based violence and zero tolerance forward. So I call to action all of us to join in advocacy, um, to make sure to, to eliminate gender-based violence, to develop a, a, a globe, a global environment of nonviolence. Um, and I'm and at this point I'm going to stop. Um, and I just want to thank you all for listening. Um, I've given you, um, I wanted to ask you all to join us at World Federation for Mental Health. If you're not a member already, we have our websites here. Um, we are working, our WFMH works on the promotion uh, and prevention of mental health and gender issues and gender-based violence is a very significant and important issue that WFMH is really working on. So please join us. Um, and if you have any questions, we'll be taking questions later. So at this time, I want to turn the program over to Chue Chang and let her um, let give her the floor. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, dear sisters and brothers, uh, I'm glad I can join this panel discussion because follow Nancy a long time ago. We have a 20 years, more than 20 years friendship. And also together with her and yeah, like Vicky, like so many people from CSW, we promote mental health all the way. So today I follow Nancy. I like to talking about how we can end the 
violence against women, sexual and reproductive health perspective. She addressed so many consequences about negative mental health. Now I just like to bring the positive mental health to use mental health as the example. So you can see who WHO talking about no health without mental health. The SDG program go three and go five, all talking about gender equality equal to mental health. It's all so many important that we need to promote well-being and achieve gender equality to empower all women and girls. So let me advocate for sexual and reproductive right, women's health from Beijing platform for action. But always right now we're talking about more on disease and services, but never or rarely talking about promoting mental health. So we need to have some understand all the situation and we can try to make the discrimination uh, to address the discrimination bias, better informed program and policies, because we can understand mental and physical condition and the social construct gender. So here we can just, I just go quickly because everybody understand mental health means to individual, to your communication with others, your, your contribute to the society. But the other way, if we need- Good morning, Lisa, yeah? Lisa? Okay. Okay. So we also know mental health promotion, you need to have economic dimension, gender dimension, social dimension, and the political dimension. And why I chose mental health? Because women's health is so important from Beijing Platform for Action. We know women's health is one major item. Right now, when we promote women's health, we should remember they has mental health together. No health without mental health. Especially when we're talking about menstruation, it's a long period go with our girls and women from menarche to menopause. Do we get any support? We really learn from that for our better mental health? Actually it's not. 2019, UN women have make lunch and the stigma period. But ending period stigma, if we need more strength on promoting mental health, then we will get more really than the, the girls through mental education. They can learn how to find strategies, understand themselves more and find strategy to fight back violence against women. So here we can see the hot problem. The girls, when she experiences menarche, she will feel breast swelling, the biological part, abdominal pain, fatigue, lower background, back pain, and acne. And for the social, you have social stigma, discrimination, taboo, or sometimes you were teased by the boys around you. And also from psychological part, mood swing, depression, frustration, premenstrual swing. So, so many body, mind, and social around the girls. So during this time, she will feel she's so hopelessness, helplessness. She doesn't like herself. If we didn't go through a good positive mental health education through the mental health. So we need to make them to have the understand the biological and also need to provide some strategies to integrate the physical, mental, and social well-being issue in the health education with holistic approaches. So when we promote, well, why we promote positive mental health for youth by mental education? Because at this stage, the girl, teens should not only learn to understand their physical and mental health, but also learn the social construct of gender. How, because the gender discrimination and gender bias from culture sometimes make the girl in the situation, hopelessness, helplessness, and don't like menstruation and don't like themselves. So we need to go through this one to promote positive mental health. 
not only individual level and also school level and national policy. Empowering girls' mental health through positive mental health to eliminate the violence against women, just like a bird sit on the tree, is never afraid of the branch breaking because her trust is not on the branch, but on its own wing. So in the last situation, I will use Taiwan's uh, example, how to ev eliminate sexual gender-based violence through positive mental health education. Actually in Taiwan, we have the past human rights convention and make national reports, CEDO, CRC, CRPD, et cetera. And Taiwan also passed gender related laws and acts like Ch Children and Youth Sexual Transaction Prevention Act, Sexual Assault Prevention Act, Domestic Violence Prevention Act, Sexual Harassment Prevention Law, so many. However, we still have some bully. We have some uh, uh, fa family violence and harassment situation. Why? Because we lack of positive mental health education. The whole society lack of gender equality education. Although we pass so many acts, the action, the action, we still need more positive way to make the, everyone understand. So you can see from the film, the, the figures, the sexual campus sexual harassment in five years, the 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 the, the, the people from yeah, though it's still the age from 2018 above is higher. The, 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 okay, the campus and campus sexual assault case in the five years also uh, you can still they have the have the, the numbers. So this is still for the girls, uh, it's for teens. And also the victim and offender, victim or most are girls and the offenders are men. So under the situation, you have bully, you have sex harassment, you have violence. So the teens, the suicide rate in the last five years is higher, especially for 20 to 24 years old. And also you can see the family violence. When they were young, under 12 years old, the boy and girl look similar. However, when you start for 12 and to 18 years old, you can see the female, the girls are higher than boys. So we need to advancement for mainstream health, research program and policies. So in Taiwan, we have, we do some work site, empowerment oriented action research on the menorrhea. And also we have a women health policy. In there, they have chapter four, women mental health and chapter eight, reproductive health right. And also the IOSH, the, the labor, labor force department, they also do some protective, working protective policy for mental health. It's not enough because the policy is there if we don't have action. So the Minister of Health and Welfare Understand. So last year we request Mental Health Association in Taiwan to produce live left and video for promoting women's mental health. Furthermore, the NGO Taiwan Little Red Hood also since 2019 followed the UN woman. So they do have the pictures and also they advocate for right of mental health uh, to stop the discrimination for period and stigma, etc. So you can see the leaf left promoting mental mental health. So we can see the dancing with youth, physical and mental health during the period. So make the girls understand the period is nature, it's with her, not discriminate by your own. And also, you know, someone have this kind of experience. So we should face together. And, and you can make diary to make the life's experience, your daily life, your habit. Maybe you eat too much, uh, uh, too much, uh, you eat too much or you have the, the emotional fracture. So you can understand, then you know, this is, then you can change your daily life. Then you can understand how you can manage your own 
nutrition stuff. Right now, because in the, so this is the movie, so one minute only, but I try, but we I can I can put the YouTube to your with our chat, then you can try to look at when we finish. It's in the YouTube, so I cannot use here, and and also because for the menstruation education, we need to okay, and also because the menstruation education, some disabled youth they come to talk to us say. Uh, we also like to have mental education, mental health education for them. And they can also face their own needs. Right now in Taiwan, I know maybe everyone also have the experience. When a girl in school, she feel uncomfortable for the biological part, it's uncomfortable. She will go to the nurse's room. So the School nurse were taking care about that. So when she have a mood swing, she feel upset. She will go to the counselor. Uh, but in a, in a school area, sometimes the, the boy will take their, uh, their menstruation stuff to, to tease them. And also when she feel tired, she feel fatigued. Some, also some girls without those experience, they will also tease them and not trust them. So those kind of negative environment, unfriendly environment also make the girls feel so helpless. And we need to integrate all the stuff because we need to have the gender mainstreaming, mental health mainstreaming program. The, the, the school nurse, school counselor and whole envir school environment should work together to make a gender friendly mental health, school campus, menstrual education, menstruation health education. Not only girls, the boys also should learn. So they know when someone has the, the school nurses need, if the student come to see you, 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 they just feel physical, some discomfort. So you only treat them, but you didn't think about the psychological part. So we need to integrate the psychological part, physical part together to integrate mental health into all kinds of program. And we need to have the gender equality, sexual health education. And also we have, because today our, our topic, so I use this as an example, the women's health is so important and menstruation experience also so important from menarche to menopause and more. So I just bring this issue to here and share my experience. We, we understand we need to have the policy. We need to have so many reports, but even we do have policy and also some acts or laws, we still need to more action, action to integrate mental health and gender equality to all the health education to all the different policy and programs in all country. So this is what uh, today my presentation. And after this one, I will say, we have propaganda time. If people like to get the, get the uh, March 23, 23rd, welcome you to this program because it's also an example, even we do have some sex harassment acts, but they cannot protect the website harassment. Even the people, uh, they are in a, in, a, in a committee for sexual harassment prevention committee. They also misunderstanding and also not understanding how the girls, the women get those kind of attacks. So I think I welcome you go to that session. You can, you can listen to the program and you will interesting. And also we shall work together to fight for the gender-based violence in the society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, it was a very interesting and really informative and important uh, information that you provided. 
um, particularly talking about gender-based violence within the context of menstrual health, uh, I think is a really a one that we don't often think about. And um, so really an important, um, very important uh, new awareness for a lot of us. Uh, so thank you for bringing that to us. I, I wanted to also um, just point out since Jay was talking about the other, there's another program that she was inviting you to, is that when WFMH, when, we, when I first started at the UN, which was back in 1991, um, so I've been around working in the UN on women's issues for quite a long time. Um, but when I first started and for many years, uh, mental health was really not on the agenda at the UN, uh, not at all. It was never mentioned. You couldn't read it about it in any of the documents, no recommendations at CSW. Um, and with the Beijing, when we went to the World Conference on Women in 1995 in Beijing, I think that we began to turn a corner through the advocacy of a group of us that really came together to make sure that mental health was included in the platform for action in 1995. And we've been seeing an increase in mental health. Uh, on the agenda, particularly at C CSW. And I just think that that just shows the importance of advocacy of all of us, you know, in making sure that this topic is, is, is present within all of the, at the UN and really within the context of all the work that we do. Um, one of the things that I hope you take away from today is thinking about how what we're talking about, what we're presenting, really can be integrated within the context of the issues that you're you're working on and within your programs, within your organizations, um, and that there's always a, a, this integration. It's always to me like a, like a stool that has two legs and it's missing one of the important legs mental health in order for to have a, a comprehensive focus um, when we're dealing with issues, particularly when you're dealing with violence against women. Um, and so with that, I just wanted to point out that I actually went through the CSW and counted um, how many programs on mental health and related issues there are. And I count on over 20 programs during CSW um, that are really covering mental health aspects. So I just thought that was extraordinary and just made me feel very proud of all of us that our awareness is raising. Um, I wanna turn the program over now to Connie Gann. Um, Connie is really has also been a good friend for a long time and has been so supportive of our work. She's been to CSW a number of times and um, she's doing some imp very important work in Australia, which she's going to talk about today. And um, Connie is uh, just on the verge of getting her PhD in public health. So we're very congratulate, we're pre-congratulating her um, on her amazing accomplishments. So Connie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for having me. I hope the slide is working. It's there, we're good. Ah, okay, thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here today and joining Nancy and Chue and all the people around the world. And I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country, this presentation brought to you today and recognizing their continuing uh, connection to land, waters and culture. And I also want to pay respects uh, to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'm always grateful uh, for the mentors that I met in CSW since my first uh, in 2013. Uh, then Nancy and Chue always like want me to think about what is your work related to mental health? Where is mental health and <laughs> where's gender, where's women? So uh, it's been an incredible professional and life path. I can say I'm very grateful uh, for, for this opportunity today. So my work actually, it's around disaster, climate change, uh, and also health adaptation in hospital healthcare uh, facilities. So my concern and my uh, community that I serve uh, is always the health uh, and also the hospital setting. So I can also, I think Nancy will agree with me, every day is mental health day. It's not just October 10, but uh, so like today, uh, we'll be talking and raising awareness and advocate for mental health and gender-based violence. So I would like to actually start, COVID really changes. Definitely the form of care. Uh, so 
previously pre-COVID we can just hug people, shake hands, but now we need to learn, relearn the way that we uh, connect with each other. Yeah. One benefit for COVID for CSW is like we can connect with each other in all around the world in this platform. And I can see that the world is getting smaller and I hope our mental health voice is getting louder and louder uh, with these changes in our life. So uh, talk about research that we knew that mental health research is not enough, but we can see actually for the first six months of pandemic, I pulled all the research uh, related with COVID and we can see actually there are some research uh, concentrating or focusing on the psychological stress or anxiety. Some of the tools or assessment are there to actually assess uh, people during the pandemic or during the lockdown uh, in the first six months. And this is the project that uh, we have been working since the pandemic that we wanted actually to, to have captured the real time impact so that we can give uh, very fast and immediate uh, evidence to feedback and inform the policy. So because in the past pandemic like Ebola or SARS that has been in hindsight research after the pandemic for six months or a year, we go back and we assess the impact. So that's not, uh, that's not good enough. And we, sell, we often see ourselves that uh, that is too late to make changes. And the trauma, the damage is already there, then it's very reversible, especially for mental health. So right now we want to make things right. So at the beginning, we have this team across a lot of countries collaborators to look at gender and COVID in real time. What is the impact that we can feedback some evidence base uh, data for, uh, for our policy makers. So if you're interested, please check out this uh, website. There is some me media metrics and some publications uh, capturing and also uh, documenting all this impact. So I would like to also point out one of the very special research that I came to. This is, this is my colleague Liao in uh, China. And when we talk about women, uh, and we see at the beginning, we, we thought that men are being uh, affected more than women. But actually, when we go deeper, where we see family cluster cases, we see women tends to be more uh, susceptible, like getting more affected uh, compared to men. And we can also see why. And when we break it down, sorry for this fancy, because I, I, I love all these graphs and data and information. But this graph tells us when we have sex disaggregated data, and we can see uh, the age difference and their roles in being a caregiver uh, for their children or their elderly, they are much more in place in a high risk of uh, being affected by COVID-19. Uh, why? And, and this paper concluded that it's because they have uh, much more responsibility to go out uh, to the market or bringing their elderly, the care uh, the, uh, the care the, the people who they care to hospital and outside in outdoor. So this is like another step that uh, the research that we need to actually understand not just the superficial uh, data on how we check about mental health impact, but what is the uh, structural and uh, the institutional uh, barriers or the social norms that actually affecting and uh, uh, making this impact more serious. So carers, not just at home, also in the hospital, healthcare sectors that we see uh, these pictures and news, although we have gender friendly policy coming up in some countries, we provide women more employment opportunities. But when we put people working it, but we don't provide them essential uh, enough uh, protection for them. So this is a, a bit of a, a trap for gender-friendly policy when you have those in place. But when you go further in the implementation, what we can see, it's actually trapping a lot of women in some uh, working uh, age. They, they need to work, but they need to also provide care to their family. And of course, in the pandemic, we see uh, the shortage of PPE and the healthcare workers, it's like 80 to 90% in some country nurses are consist of women. So the vulnerable uh, populations of women are still 
not being protected, although they have been given these employment opportunities. So the picture on your right is the uh, protest in France, uh, dentists and medical professionals, they don't want to go to work because the shortage of uh, PPE. Um, but in the other hand, another culture in China, uh, like nurses and go women have to be uh, forced to shave their hair and they've like been forced to like men up uh, to take up the role of uh, protecting the community and the country. So this is also another picture of uh, the Philippines. So we can see one of the sign on the wall say that you have to remain in your PPEs. Because of the shortage, we don't have enough PPE for uh, the healthcare workers to exchange or change the, the PPE. So they have to remain in them in the whole shift. So you can imagine if you're a woman, you're menstrual and you can't eat, you can't drink, you can just the toilet and you have to be in that PPE just to, you know, just, it's, it's a very uncomfortable uh, situation. And also because of the uh, novel of this disease, we don't know much at the beginning and we keep changing some of the protocol and supplies doesn't get, get up, like uh, get up with this uh, uh, manufacture of all this thing. So we have, rules and regulations change overnight and hospitals are not prepared for all these supplies. So I also work with the hospital and see what we can do actually. So always in my heart, I will want to listen to the people that I serve, what are the story, what are their needs? How can we bring in resources to actually address this problem? So we partner with the hospital uh, nurses and all the doctors and see what are actually their need and what can we do? So we tried some experiment. Uh, then we see the new protocol is not actually uh, very protective for our healthcare workers. And the nurses also uh, tells us and share us about their concern of putting on and putting off all this PPE is very dangerous. And they're afraid to go home to their family uh, because they, they are afraid that they will take this virus, go back to their home and their loved ones. Um, they are also, very stressful without taking out, so they don't, they are not uh, hydrated. Uh, they don't have enough food and rest. So it's very uh, hard and uh, stressful situation. So we came up with this in retrofitting uh, device to help uh, to change some of the windows in the emergency department um, so that the clinician can be one side of the, the window and the patient will be another side. So it looks like this and we can just communicate through the walkie talkie uh, on the wall. So this retrofitting uh, device is actually not new. You might see this in another, uh, in a laboratory or something like that. But this idea was brought in because we asked the nurses what they need and we asked who can actually help with uh, this retrofitting and making all this integrated. So it's, as Nancy say, a wicked problem, or uh, we can't uh, solve one of the problem just from one person. We need a teamwork. Everyone needs to come in together and build this uh, consensus and partnering. So this is uh, something that we did under uh, 3,000. It's very cheap, it's very low cost, uh, uh, intervention, but it's also been uh, recommended by the WHO guide for uh, uh, for the whole world. So uh, in my papers, I argued that uh, climate resilience or health, it's a health service has to, it's, it's intersectional. So uh, gender climate is just a lens in the toolkit. So how can we use all this and bring and merge and link and network everybody together to be all force? So the second example I would like to also bring to you is a, a project in uh, in Philippines that we know that climate impacts is increasing all around the world, and we also see that the sexual and reproductive health rights is very important. Like uh, Professor Zhang Jue was mentioning earlier in the, her presentation, um, and we see the uh, lack of and also the <laughs> uh, neglected uh, services during. Uh, not just the pandemic, also the climate related disaster that are amplifying and accelerating all around the world. So we had this project also 
inviting some of the medical professional, they are the trusted voices in the community to go into the community and talk to them, like what are their needs and how can we help? So in this process, actually, uh, we found out that the sexual reproductive health services is not just uh, taking care of baby or when you're pregnant. It's more of a problem that the community have a raping issue, like girls, uh, young girls being raped by their uncles or their neighbors and they blame themselves, their mom blamed them. So there's the deeper uh, structural and cultural issues that we need to deal with. But through this section of reproductive health, if we don't put in a mental health lens or a gender lens, we just see that, okay, maybe we just need to send some doctors or some examination car to do all these health services. It's not solving the root cause uh, of all this issue. So I would just like to end uh, by also saying that uh, this day, yes, especially yesterday in Australia, we have this March for Justice uh, movement. Uh, so we want to say that enough is enough. So all of us here, is, we are here, it's not we want to be here, it's just we need to be here. Um, it's, oh, sorry. And I know that thousands and hundreds of people have joined the march uh, yesterday, rallies across the nation demanding an end uh, to gender uh, violence and equality. And I know that we have all different points of emphasis of what we do, but I think this point of uh, of this issue and if it, in this uh, time, I we really need to like band together. So extremity is to to stop. We need to really partner and join forces. Uh, to advocate for our uh, mental health. Thank you very much. Nancy, you need to unmute. Ah. Uh, Connie, I would like to thank you um, for your presentation. And I just wanted to add that you're bringing such an important perspective when we really think about the roles that women have uh, in, in, um, and often have jobs at the lower, uh, lower income level, that they are often so much more vulnerable. Um, particularly, I think COVID has brought to light so many issues uh, for women uh, really highlighted the, the vulnerability of women. Um, so we are seeing such much higher numbers of COVID, obviously, in low-income people, but particularly low-income women, because they often um, cannot stay home. Um, they don't have the luxury. They must go to work. They're often in professions that, as essential workers. Um, and so it's critically important to, to recognize the disparities and equities uh, that women often face by virtue of their socioeconomic um, conditions, and how it plays into not only their health issues, but their mental health issues as well. So I think we, we had some time for some questions. If anybody would like to. Um, uh, no, we don't know how to write on the board. Can we, can, can we mute our, our mics? Um, and maybe you can raise your hand and we can we can call on you if anyone has a question. No questions. Uh, I think Madison raised her yeah. hand. Hi, I would. Oh, can you can you unmute yourself or? Uh, yes, I unmuted and it muted back. Um, I would like okay. to about uh, initiatives being taken for trans women, because I know that they are more likely to face violence and more likely to face mental health problems. Are you, are you asking if there's any specific project? Is that what you're? Uh, yeah, I would just like to know more about like what initiatives are being currently taken for trans women. 
I think that the, unfortunately, like all of the mental health programs are, are limited, um, but we are seeing um, a, a rise in the awareness about violence and mental health, particularly the connection, I think in many of the LGBT programs that we have here in New York. So it, primarily I can speak for what we're doing in New York. Um, but I think it's another um, undervalued um, or group or unrecognized, let me say, unrecognized group of people, LGBTQ um, group, and that we need to, uh, to under the, when we speak about women, we, and we really, that's why I think we're talking about gender, that we really need to expand out to really talk about providing services and programs and making sure that there are, that groups that are not being served well, um, are really being targeted for better services, more attention, more awareness. Um, that goes along with my comment about women, who, low income women as well. So um, thank you for bringing that up. I think that's a really critical point. And uh, um, yeah, I should have made more emphasis about that when I was speaking earlier. So I'll remember that. Yes. Any other, anybody else? Hi, um, I'm Akina and I'm from the Philippines. I represent the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts. So um, aside from doing um, activity with WAGS, I'm also an educator myself. And I think this is really a problem that I personally face. So I would like to ask um, specifically, specifically among educators, um, how do we get or what are some programs that you do or examples of activities or things that you do to somehow support educators, to support uh, girls in their schools who face uh, gender-based violence for that matter. But really, thank you for um, this session because it's really an eye-opening uh, session for me. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, would you like to respond to that? Uh, no, repeat again, because I just try to find some work for other panel talking about LGBTQ. Yeah, some because in uh -huh. Taiwan, we have passed the, 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 the couple of yeah. yeah, so that's why I will say, uh, I will choose some because we have some other panel. So later, maybe you can put in your name on the chat list. I can send some other information to you. Yeah, but the question yeah. that you can ask, Connie, maybe you ask. Uh, yeah, because I was also involved with the Taiwan Mental Health Association that we have a program to collaborate with librarians. So we uh, select some of the mental health related storybooks and we had this program to also have a book club uh, for a librarian and educators to have a session that a uh, resource for them. So sometimes mental health is a huge distance pro project or pro uh, issue, but, but how can we also make it very tangible and uh, small like parenting uh, uh, ish, uh, topics for, uh, for girls and women. So it's like uh, different themes every year. So we select a group of books uh, for all the uh, primary school library. Okay, that means uh, yes. in one way we use the BBO therapy. So you can read book and get therapy. Yeah, therapy by yourself, by the book list. The book list including movies, music, or some book. And also we use the picture, picture books. It's easy to assess by the children. So right now we have a promoting school mental health program for the uh, school campus. Yeah, for the elementary school children. And also social emotional learning program. But it, sometimes it's all take effort by NGO. So some NGO train the parents, the social emotional learning and as a volunteer, go into the school to teach the students. But for the teacher, sometimes they just will say they are too busy. But right now we try to use picture book uh, to make the uh, librarian, because librarian will go to the class to teach instead of some counselor. Counselors are too busy to make, to work on the people. <laughs> they think they are in trouble. Actually, we need to promote mental health. So make the library teacher go to the class, classroom, make the student understand 
how they can get their receivance, how they can interact with some disabled classmates. So I, I think those kind of activities is very important. So we use this as a mental health project to implement into the school level. Then next step, we need to ask in the government to pay attention. They need to have the mental health education promotion law in the educational department. This is one of the minutes of education. Yeah, but right now we just contact the district education department and asking them to cooperate because we will go to the elementary school to teach the teachers and they can support us. Then they can aware how important that is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I, I, you. I wanted to add to that also is that um, on if you go on the WFM website, WFMH website, uh, I posted it on chat, by the way, um, is that we have a number of educational materials um, that are available that um, have been produced throughout the years for our, our World Mental Health Day. Um, I also wanted to point out that um, in the beginning of COVID, the WHO um, put to, created a, a wonderful storybook for children um, explaining uh, COVID. Uh, and it was widely distributed, but I don't think it was un wi distributed widely enough, unfortunately. Um, and I thought it was a tremendous amount. I heard good things from teachers who said that they used it and read it to their children or had their children read it. Um, and I also want to say that I think that one of the things that I'm always advocating for is how we integrate mental health into existing programs. So in particularly in terms of teachers, we ask teachers to do so much, unfortunately. Um, so I'm almost hesitant to add one more burden to teachers, except that you are dealing with all of the mental health aspects of things with children every single day. But I think it's important to think about college and universities and, and um, training programs for teachers um, that in the very beginning integrate mental health within the context of the education that they get so that we're not trying to play catch up that it really becomes an integrated part of, of teachers learning process. Um, the other thing that I think we can do is really work with teachers to train them to social interventions to become mental health professionals, but to do psychosocial interventions that would um, that would address initial or basic um, or, or more um, less chronic mental health issues and to be able to identify problems and then provide resources where teachers can either um, refer children out and families, by the way, because children exist within the context of, of families. Um, that, and, and so when a child has a problem, we really have to work with the families and to try to find resources where we can provide that support to families is critically important for, for teachers. I think teachers are on the front line of being able to identify problems early so that it becomes prevention, um, that the earlier you intervene with mental health problems, the better the outcomes. Other questions? Thank you for your question, Kina. If anybody has any comments that they want to add, um, share their own experience. We're happy to have that as well, not just questions. Um, Nancy, there's some question on the chat box. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing the question. I'm not seeing it, Connie. Um, I think from uh, Ms. Shalit for uh, Professor Zhang. Oh, that's a question. Can she because I don't see her on the I don't see her on the list. Miss Chavez. Hello. What is the question? Uh, she's asking how how have educational institutions at your school embraced the model for learning of sex and mental health? Uh, at what age do you feel these conversations? should be taking place? I think for the health education in school, elementary school and senior junior high school, that will be very important because uh, also we need to, like we're talking about picture, picture books, uh, we need to also follow the development concept, how children can understand. And also we have the question 
make the teacher teacher interact with students, make them to think about, to they read the stories, get a similar experience, then ask if you are there, what you will do. Not asking directly for him, for them. Yeah, so that make the defense will be less. And also not like a dominant way to interact. But for sexual education, actually right now we do have the uh, core class, but like I mentioned, sometimes they're only talking about physical st structure and really touch about others. The emotional part are less, but they integrate into the gender equality education. They have the emotional uh, affection education. So they need to link together, not individual. So that's why we propose so men mental health education they should have put physical and mental health together. And also at the same time, they need to understand how social discriminate them, how they can find some strategy to fight back or to get to social support. And as a group to raise the questions and to raise the, uh, how to say that, the, the, the school environment. Uh -huh. uh, so in Taiwan, we have some NGO like a, uh, health equity education, gender equity education association. They try to do many natural health education to school. Yeah, not enough, not enough. So we had a question from Ms. Char uh, Charlotte Reed. Uh, her question was, how have, have educational institutions such as schools embraced the model of learning of sex and mental health? Oh, you just spoke about that. I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong question. Um, so I think sexual education is very important for everyone. Not only the, the, the young, young girl and the boys and also their parents. Sometimes the parents are also difficult to open their mouths to discuss with uh, them. So which, we have a question um, that would, would you please introduce the mechanism of gender training programs for psychiatrists that had especially meeting visitors who actually assaulted or experienced domestic violence? So I, 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 I think that, um, I personally think that none of us receive enough gender training, um, not in particularly in school. So I don't whether you're a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker or other mental health professionals. I don't think gender is often enough of an issue, um, and so I think we need to increase the amount of training. I do. I have to say that in the U.S. that um, in most hospitals that in the emergency room, if they, a, a, a woman comes in who's been uh, assaulted, uh, is, a, is a sexually assaulted, that there are um, special units within most hospitals and protocols that are established to, to, um, to handle or to work with that woman. Um, unfortunately, as I had pointed out earlier, um, only 40% of women actually report so that unfortunately 60%, if not really more, are really silent and don't come into a medical facility for treatment after being assaulted. Um, and I think that we have to do better in terms of, of, of raising public awareness, developing public health campaigns around this area to, um, to destigmatize the issue and make it more, uh, make the system more accessible um, for women to come forward. And in Taiwan, it's very special because we passed the gender equality, equality education law. So every school, you, you need to have four, every year you, have, you need to have four hours teach gender equality. And also for the all government staff, or others, they all need to have four hours a year to have the gender equality education. This is the one part. But for serious gender equality education, then sometimes will be organized by school level or university level. So it's independent. 
it's not. Uh, but of course, we also have the, like a, uh, we op we offer the gender course, gender relation course. So it's a whole year, uh, uh, some sem semester for the students. So they it will take two hours a week, and you have uh, eighteen weeks. Yeah, so that is will be integrated into the school level, the university level. So we have many universities, they offer a gender relation course to the students. And also we have other gender related course, classes. So I think this is uh, a special one in Taiwan. If you are interested, we can list the course name to you. Yeah, so to, we, we will try our best because we pass the gender equality education law. And someone asking for the LGB, LGBTQ or transgender situation. Uh, if, because I see Yu Yu join our group, I see his name. I don't know if Yu Yu Zhongtai can talk about how our government treats the transgender person. Do they have any mental health problem and any help? Nancy, can we? Say that again. I'm so sorry. Yeah, because I see <clears throat> Zhong Tai in the name in the name list. So I think I will invite him to talk because before one person asking about LGBTQ, yeah. especially for the uh, the 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 transgender, how mm -hmm. we treat a transgender person, how is their uh, mental health status, how our, the government effort and uh, NGO effort. So. Can you talk about that? Okay, okay. then you talk. Hello, guys. Uh, this is Zhongtai Yu Yu. I'm from Taiwan. And I uh, I work with the LGBTQ uh, uh, community. But in Taiwan, because the gender equality law uh, have passed, and uh, we have we have a lot, sorry, we have a lot uh, about uh, a lot of, a lot of situation we will discuss about how the LGBTQ student will meet in their their community or in school, and uh, because in Taiwan we have protected the as a the minority group. So nowadays the uh, teacher in school they have to to teach and uh, to educate students to how to prevent, and uh, it will become another kind of. Uh, uh, test. If you you a uh, student will need to pass the test every every semester. Yeah. And uh, uh, but nowadays, uh, because the transgender uh, issue is not is not so uh, wildly wildly discussing discussing in school. So nowadays we just discuss about the uh, discuss us uh, uh, discuss a lot LGBTQ issue as an issue, not the a uh, really problem or or the uh, the problem they they have already met, but uh, nowadays, uh, in Taiwan, they have uh two years ago the transgender student they they are forced to uh leave the school because of the violence, and uh, the uh the uh the uh, uh, school mates uh say uh say some say the uh, terrible words. So nowadays we also have the law to protect this kind of student. And uh, not only the protect the student, we are also ask the school teacher and the, uh, the label of our minister, they have to make new law or to more detail to protect all the students to, uh, against the uh, violence, not, uh, not only the uh, the, the violence, not only the physically, but also the social, uh, the, the society or psycho violence. Thank you. Thank you, Yo Yo. We have a, a comment or a um, Carol, uh, Co Carola, Floor. Would you like to make a comment? She wrote, she wrote uh, in the chat that in Ecuador, the reality is very different. Um, and um, and she, I think that she was talking about the experience with women going into the system. And she said, in Ecuador, the reality is very different. 
women are forced to repeat their declarations many times. None, no sensitivity for women who were raped or victims of violence. And I think that that occurs in most cases. And while I said we have these specialized programs here in most hospitals, um, it doesn't always work well either. Uh, so um, I think um, we all we have to do better. All of us have to do better. And we have to really continue our advocacy campaigns and, and our demands, actually, um, that systems get better, that they treat victims um, better, uh, that victims are not blamed, uh, which is often the case. Uh, we see that over and over again. There's so many cases in the media, I think, as particularly with the Me Too movement that is coming forward, that women are coming forward more to report about their experiences of sexual harassment and violence that they've experienced. And we're seeing a lot of um, shaming in, and blaming in the media um, and from the systems that those people work in. Uh, and I think that that's always been the case. I think that if, uh, if I were to canvas most women in this program that are attending today, that probably 99% of us, if we were all, maybe 100% of us, if we were all being honest, would admit that we have experienced sexual harassment uh, or sexual abuse and violence uh, in, our, in our lifetimes. Um, and, and to think back, and I can say that from my own experience, I think back at times when I was young, um, that I experienced um, sexual harassment in several workplaces that I was in, and I did not come forward. As I got older, I was able to um, push back and to really stand up for myself within the system, but I never reported it into a, the larger system or really called it sexual harassment. With the awareness that we have today, we're, we're gaining more awareness. And I, I hope that we are giving women more voice, more opportunities to come forward and to really speak their mind um, and to feel safe within the system, that the system is going to have their backs and take care of them in the systems. But that's only going to occur is if we demand change and we no longer tolerate the, the, the culture that exists that allows women to, um, that forces women to be silent and not to have be supported through the systems when they do come forward. Any, any other comments? Yeah, Camilla, hello. Yes, hello. Um... I'm a psychologist and I'm joining for, from the Netherlands. Uh, regarding what you were um, pointing out right now, I was um, well also thinking on my own experiences and how education needs to also, I think one of the big problems is that uh, the way we understand violence is not, there are misunderstandings in what violence is. We tend to think of it as like an individual issue and then we don't see like the systemic uh, aspect of it, which also I'm thinking of when I was younger and situations in which I did not recognize something as sexual harassment or as violence because um, it just didn't look like what I thought violence looked like. Uh, the idea of the strange man in that dark alley. Um, so I was thinking about that and also about um, how to engage uh, boys and men into all of these conversations as well, which I think is uh, a big challenge because a lot of people feel very defensive when you start touching on these issues. If you maybe could uh, share some uh, experience working and engaging boys and men in uh, conversations about gender-based violence. Does anyone want to respond to that? I feel like I'm responding to a lot of, a lot of things. I'll respond. I, I've been working with Ubuntu, e U B U N T U, and men and gay. And so this is international. They've had a lot of meetings where they talk together about how to bring men and boys into this conversation because we, we have to look at it holistically. If uh, unfortunately, so many women are experiencing harassment and worse up to rape 
and 90, 95% of these crimes are per, done by men, how do we work with early childhood education and our global society to help men and boys channel their sexual needs and their aggressive tendencies in other ways so that women are not victimized, but instead honored as truly earth is honored and women and girls are honored. So again, I, I would say join in because there are many men that I was on a call also about the he, he for she, H-E-F-O-R-S-H-E, and this is also global. There are a lot of men and boys who are addressing this issue to try to help bring everybody together so that we're not waiting till a woman goes to the hospital so that we're, we're enabling our girls to stand up for themselves, to not be victims. So hope this is helpful. Thank you, Shanti. Appreciate that comment. Um, I just, we have just a few seconds to go before the session ends. So I um, will use my prerogative as chairing the program to just say some final final words. Um, I First of all, I thank you all for coming. The numbers of people who signed up for this, this workshop is indicative of the interest in the area. And I think also a sign of the progress that we've made in, in bringing awareness to the, the issues of of mental health and, and the interconnectedness it has with, um, with violence. It seems evident, but when you really begin to look at the literature, you just see that mental health gets very short shrift. It gets a very small portion. It gets mentioned, it's often said yes, and we need to provide mental health intervention, but it's really not talked about in a way that rises to the level that it needs to be to really address the complexities of what happens to women who experience violence. Um, I've been using the word a lot about violence, but I, when we're talking, because this is a program on women and girls, but this really does extend to marginalized, to all marginalized groups. I also want to say that even in my practice, that when we begin to scratch the surface and we get rid of the stigma, if we can break through the stigma, we find that a great many men or boys have often been sexually abused and um, as well. And it's something that we tend not to recognize. And I think we really have to do that. Um, talk about partnering and we also have to think about how we um, socialize children. And that, you know, with all the, the progress that we've made and the awareness that we have, we still are in this cycle of violence against women. Women are not safe and you have to ask why. And while we are, you know, how do, how do we raise our sons? You know, how is it that we raise our sons to become abusers? Um, you know, and, and it isn't as, as one of the um, per people spoke earlier said, you know, that to question, um, you know, what happened to us as young, younger when we were, some of us were younger, what's happening to young women now? I mean, something, we're not doing something right in terms of um, um, socializing and educating and developing values of nonviolence and equality. And we really have to address that both er in early education, right from the very beginning, but also within the home. Um, and I think we need to do that with more public health um, um, uh, awareness programs um, and through all these other places in which families and children interact, whether it's in reproductive health programs, which I think is a, an amazing place for us to really do interventions um, in these areas. So reproductive health programs and medical facilities and educational facilities so that we are really turning the tide on this program so that women can really live um, peacefully without fear, um, not only on the street, but in their homes as well. So I wanna thank you all for coming um, to our program. It, it's really great to have you all here. Um, I, I put up um, my email address. We're building a network. Um, we wanna collect as many names of you and, and, and contact information. So please email me and let me know if you'd like to be on a, on a list with us to continue this dialogue and our work and how we can potentially share experiences. There's so much more experiences that um, many of you have that would be useful for others to know, including what you're working on that, that can be shared with others that they can use in, in their programs and in their lives as well. So I encourage you all to email me. 
Um, if you go on the file section of our program, you will see I uploaded our bios, but each of the bios has our contact information and information for um, WFMH as well. So um, uh, please join us in our work. Um, it's an uphill battle to get mental health um, to recognized, and I, we need all of you in our fight uh, to really address mental health and to really work on prevention and promotion of mental health. Uh, and I hope to see you all next year in person here in New York at CSW. Um, and I hope you all um, stay well and healthy and everyone gets vaccinated as soon as possible. So thank you all for coming. Um, have a great CSW. Take good care and I hope to hear from all of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Take care.